joining us today um, for the presentation on how towns can manage conflicts with beavers. My name is Lincoln Frasca. I'm a conservation planning specialist with Vermont Fish and Wildlife. I'm joined today by Tyler Brown, a wildlife specialist, and he'll introduce himself in a moment. And we also have Jens Hilke here working the back end of this meeting. Uh, he'll be monitoring the uh, chat room for questions as well as uh, loading in some resources as we go through the presentation today. So just some notes on Microsoft Teams, if you're not already super familiar. Uh, we are able to control our videos and mics. You should all see that at the top or bottom of your screens. If you keep your mics off during the presentation to cut down on background noise, and we do have uh, quite a bit of people on the, ch on the meeting today, so if you're having bandwidth issues, just shut your video off and that should help as well. And if you have access to the chat bubble, that's a button on the ribbon, uh, feel free to put your name and your town or your organization that you're a part of into the chat so we can have a sense of who's with us today as well as um, you can put in your, your questions or your comments as, as we go right into the chat. We'll have some breaks throughout the presentation and we'll take those questions in the chat. If we have time at the end, we might be able to do a couple uh, live questions as well. So our agenda is, is right here. We're gonna have Tyler talking about beaver biology, history, as well as the beaver baffle program. And then I will close out with uh, some beaver management and town planning here in Vermont. So just to just to introduce ourselves, um, we are the Fish and Wildlife Department, and our mission is the conservation of fish, wildlife, plants, and their habitats for all the people in Vermont. And that's a that's a pretty big, broad mission. Um, we do serve all Vermonters and all living things. Um, we, we can serve at many different scales, from the species scale um, all the way up to you know, full habitats and natural communities. Um, so we are looking at conservation from all angles. And like I said, we, we serve everybody um, who lives or comes to visit in our state. We work with entire communities, uh, as well as individual landowners looking to improve habitat on their property and outdoor enthusiasts, both both active and passive recreationists. And we are we're committed to to serving future generations. And uh, we we want to ensure that the healthy and thriving wildlife and wild places we enjoy here today are um, available for our, our children and grandchildren. So Jens and I make up the Community Wildlife Program, and we offer a lot of webinars like these, as well as an environmental leadership training, which is wrapping up this spring. And we do all kinds of municipal technical assistance, and we work with regional planning commissions to help towns and whole regions achieve natural resource planning goals. Um, and our services are free and um, available to you and your town. If you need them, please reach out to us and we can help you uh, look at the science behind the land use planning. So with that, I'm going to pass it over to Tyler to introduce yourself and get us going with some beaver biology. Um, well, hey, everybody. Thanks for joining us today. It's great to see that we have so many people here. Um, and my name is Tyler Brown. I'm a wildlife specialist with Vermont Fish and Wildlife, and um, I've been been with the department for about 10 years now um, in various roles, both fisheries and um, now with the wildlife program for the past about eight years um, with the, the beaver baffle program. Um, so we're going to dive right into it here. Um, most people are probably familiar with with beavers. They've probably seen them or seen their work on the landscape at the very least. Um, on land, beavers are fairly clumsy, awkward animals, although they can move pretty quickly when they need to. Um, but they're really adapted to life in, in the water, in and around water. They're an aquatic mammal, um, and they rarely venture far from the water. Um, and they've evolved to, to be really efficient moving around. So. They have a torpedo shaped body, large webbed hind feet and a flat tail for efficient swimming. Um, they have transparent membranes over their eyes 
um, to allow them to, to see underwater. They almost act like swim goggles, essentially. Um, their nose and ear channels automatically close when they dive underwater. And this is really interesting. They have fur lined lips, which close behind their, their incisors. And they can exchange, they're, they're really efficient when they take take a breath. So they can exchange as much as 75% of the air in their lungs um, to usable oxygen, allowing them to stay underwater for up to 15 minutes. Um, humans, we can only um, convert about 15% of that air to usable oxygen. So beavers are vegetarians or herbivores, what we call, um, and they primarily eat trees. And what they're really after is that cambium layer of the tree, and that's the inner layer of the bark, and that's what supplies the tree with, with most of the nutrients. Uh, some of their preferred uh, tree species are willows, aspen, alders, maples, um, a lot of the riparian tree species that you're going to find in and around wetlands or, or stream banks. Um, in the summertime, they'll also eat sedges and cattails um, in more herbaceous matter as well. So beavers are territorial animals. Um, and like most animals, they try to avoid conflicts at all, whenever possible. Um, and they do this by building caster mounds. Um, and a caster mound is essentially just a pile of mud on the shore bank where they secrete what we call castoreum, and it's a scent gland. Um, and this helps mark their territory. So any other beavers swimming through this area, they smell this, they know it's occupied. Um, and it's kind of the, the first line of defense for, for defending that territory. So beavers have long guard hairs, um, which protect the soft, very dense underfur um, underneath, which provides really good insulation. Um, and they use that castoreum, not only for marking the territory, but also waterproofing the fur. So you can see that beaver in the background it is working that, that oil, that gland through its fur to help continue to, to waterproof it. Um, and then you can probably hear that crunching or that gnawing in the front and that front beaver is, is, is chewing on some sticks there. Um, so a typical beaver colony supports two breeding adults and then typically around on average two juveniles and then two to four kits that are born each year. Um, those two year old juveniles will be kicked out of the that beaver pond or that colony in that spring upon the arrival of new kids. Um, beavers build lodges like the one you see. I'm sure most people have, have seen those. Um, or they're also build what we call bank dens, where if you have a steep river bank or um, lake shore, they'll actually burrow into the bank, excavate the area, kind of like what you see here. Um, to, to live. So there's actually multiple stories or levels in a beaver lodge. The lower level will be where they'll bring in sticks to to eat. And then the upper level is actually where they'll build almost like a small nest. And that's where they're going to raise their young. Um, in the photo to the bottom left, that's in a, a, a lake or a pond, I'm assuming. And in the wintertime, that will completely freeze over. So beavers rely on an underwater food cache, which you kind of see to the to the right of that photo. That's going to be a bunch of sticks that the beavers have collected in the fall time, brought back to the lodge and stored there. Because um, when the water freezes over, they're not able to get out onto dry land to collect any more um, food. So they rely on that food cache to survive the wintertime. Um, and if they don't build enough food, big enough food cache, or if the ice forms early or is late to melt, they could actually starve if they don't have a big enough food cache. So we've we've all heard it. Beavers are a keystone species that the habitat that they create by building dams is incredibly important for a lot of fish, wildlife, plant species, um, not only here in Vermont, but across the country. Um, so typically what a beaver will do is they'll move into a stream, they'll build a dam or a series of dams 
flood that area, um, impounding water, creating really good habitat. And as they they do that, they'll expand, build more dams, um, and then they'll live there as long as they t as long as they can until they deplete the food source. And then they'll they'll either continue to move upstream or move downstream. And then over time, those dams will break back down, and the site will revert back to what it was prior to beavers living there. Um, so what these beaver dams do is they they slow the flow of water and really increase the productivity of it. Um, so it increases the abundance of plankton or phytoplankton, which is like your algae, and that supports the zooplankton. And the zooplankton gets fed on by like your macroinvertebrates, and then you have your fish species that will feed on those macroinvertebrates, like your your caddisflies, your midges, your stoneflies. Um, and this is really starting the basis of of the food web. Um, so then you have like your birds, your otter, your mink that are feeding on the fish, and it kind of goes goes right on up up through. Um, these these wetlands that these beavers create are like filters. Um, so again, they slow the flow of water. They allow sediments to filter out of suspension. They're helping clean the water. They're recharging groundwater and aquifers. Um, so that can reduce the effects of drought and it can also when these beaver dams hold they can actually reduce downstream flooding because they're allowing that flood energy to dissipate across the the landscape so they're re they're also re-helping or helping reconnect these streams with floodplains um, and they're increasing the stream complexity within in these systems so a lot of people think Beaver created wetlands, they think of them full of water. Um, and while that's really important, these abandoned beaver flowages are are just as important. Um, so like I said, beaver created wetlands are cyclic in nature. So beavers will move into an area, live there until they deplete the food source and then move on. And that cycle may be every couple of years. It could be every few years. It really depends on the food availability, uh, food avail availability excuse me, food availability there, um, and also just the beaver population and abundance in that surrounding area. Um, but when beavers abandon the site, those dams will be not no longer maintained, so they'll be holding back less and less water. And when that soil and that sediment is exposed to the oxygen, it's incredibly nutrient rich, and it'll green up fairly quickly. Um, and it supports a whole whole host of other wildlife species. So in the springtime, this is a really good spot for, for black bears to go for forage in the springtime because it's one of the first places that has green vegetation. Um, later on in the year and later on in the cycle, it can be really dense with vegetation. So it's a great spot for, for fawns to come and give birth to hide those fawns. And with that, it's also a good place for predators like bobcats and coyotes to come and forage as well. So that's just a quick overview of beaver biology. I'll pause quickly here if there are any questions before we move on. There are no questions in the chat at this time, Tyler, but I would encourage everybody to please write your questions in there and we'll address them at the next break. All right, awesome. So now we'll dive into the history because we can't really talk about beavers without really understanding um, the history of beavers, not only in Vermont, but across the world. Um, so in most of Europe, by the end of the 1300s, beavers were complete, due to un completely unregulated taking of fur, beavers were extirpated for most of Europe. Um, and beavers were always a, a prized animal because their, their fur is incredibly valuable. It's very warm and dense, um, and it was uniquely suited for felting. Um, so maybe familiar with the, the Stetson hat that is made of beaver fur. Um, and most of the beaver, not only for its fur can be utilized, but its meat is actually pretty good table fare. And the tail is a good source of fat as well. Um, so when Europeans first landed to the New World, um, Native Americans were using flint knives, bone awls, stone or skin kettles um, and the European tools were so vastly superior at this time um, and when the Native Americans became aware of this they wanted them and 
fur was was became the the currency for getting those. Um, so, for example, ten beaver pelts could buy one gun. Um, one beaver pelt could buy variously um, a half pound of powder, four pounds of shot, a hatchet, eight knives, half pound of beads, or a pound of tobacco. Um, and this is what really ensued this whole system of trade that would catapult the Native Americans from the Stone Age into the Iron Age. Um, and by the mid 1670s, nearly a quarter million beavers had been shipped to London from the Connecticut River Valley alone. Um, and as you can imagine, this unregulated take um, made beavers become scarce in most of the area. And because of this, this is what really drove the exploration to the West um, it was that demand for fur and this efficient trade system of trade, which developed between the settlers and the Native Americans swept across the whole continent and leaving in a wake its decimated populations of these these native native species. So focusing here a little more on Vermont, um, Vermont was settled a little later than southern New England. In 1670, we had only around 3,000 settlers of European descent, but that increased to 155,000 by 1800. And as a result, in addition to the unregulated trapping, Vermont went from 90 to 95 percent forest to about 30 percent forest by the 1850s. Um, in that, in, as you can imagine, that influenced the number of species that could be able to survive here. Um, and many of our most iconic species were lost during this period of time just due to this vast habitat change, um, including our deer, turkey, fisher, martin, wolves, mountain lions, Atlantic salmon. Beaver, on the other hand, had been gone from the landscape for almost 100 years before people settled here. So during this time, many of our roads and infrastructure were built on the landscape in the absence of beaver. Um, Vermont has now over, I think, like 15,000 road miles and um, both state and town roads. Um, Vermont has an untold number of, of businesses and residents that have private driveways, private infrastructure. Um, and when you overlap all that infrastructure with the number of streams, ponds, wetlands that we have, the opportunities for conflict with beaver is really high. So we began to reintroduce beavers into Vermont in the 1920s and 30s. Um, we caught them in, in New York and Maine and brought them here and by 19 or in 1941, we started to do surveys to see how they were doing. Um, and in 1941, the first survey revealed that we had beavers nearly in every county in Vermont, and we estimated the population to be around 400. We repeated that survey in 1944, and that survey revealed 1,100 beavers around the state. We again repeated that survey in 1949, and that survey revealed that we had 8,000 beavers. Um, so this reintroduction that we did really coincided with the aband abandonment of many Vermont's farms. So those fields were reverting back to wetlands. You had a lot of young forest coming up. So it really created just like this ideal habitat without many predators um, for the beaver population just to explode. Um, and in 1950, we opened up a 15 day trapping season for them because um, nuisance activity complaints began to skyrocket. Um, and ever since then, the population has continued to grow and is currently abundant, most importantly, healthy and sustainable. And that all has occurred along regulated trapping. So without natural predators, humans are really the most effective means of controlling the population. And through a heavy, heavily regulated trapping season, we promote the sustained use of beaver. Um, and our trappers, whether in intentionally or not, are often targeting those individuals that are most likely to, to create conflicts for people. They're going to places where they're easily accessible. So that's going to be 
people's backyards or along um, some of our roads and right aways and things like that. So as the beaver population continues to grow alongside our human population, again, conflicts between people or people and beavers are going to also increase. And because we recognize the incredible importance of beavers on the landscape and their ecological role that they play, we have been working to resolve these conflicts um, so that towns, road crews, and landowners can live with the beavers, but at the same time, um, but at the same time, resolve the conflicts that they have and allow the beavers to, to continue about their business for, for the great habitat that they can, can create. We found that people value wildlife and so they begin to create problems and cost them them money. So we started the, the Beaver Wetlands Conservation Project in 2000. And again, this was a um, this project began because we want we recognize the importance of beavers and we wanted a way to further help our citizens resolve these conflicts. Um, so the idea of the program is to provide on site technical assistance to landowners, towns, road crews, um, provide them with recommended recommendations for resolving these conflicts while trying to maintain the beaver created wetland habitat. And in 2002, along with DEC, we wrote the, the best management practices for resolving human beaver conflicts in Vermont. And this was really a, a guideline for people to follow to give them um, the basis for, for dealing with conflicts um, on their own and also giving them the framework to do so. Um, we have currently funding through the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, um, which is supplemented by Pittman-Robertson Act, and we have funds for, for materials to build devices through the Vermont Duck Stamp Program. Um, what we typically do is we ask landowners or towns to either contribute roughly 50% of the materials to install a device or 50% of the cost to install, install those devices. So I provide on-site technical assistance to people um, throughout the state, and I get calls that range from everything you can imagine relating to beaver. Um, some of the most common calls that we get are, are beavers chewing trees or beavers that have built dams and they're concerned about flooding or flooding property. Um, and then I work quite a bit with towns and landowners who have beavers that are plugging culverts or threatening threatening to wash out roads. So I'm a pretty busy guy. Uh, beaver calls are starting to, to pour in right now um, as the ice is beginning to melt. Um, but on average, I'm yielding around 400 calls and emails regarding specifically regarding beaver activity. Um, and those are only calls that come in directly to me or forwarded to me. That doesn't include the calls that are warden service are yielding or, and are dealing with or other biologists that are, are dealing with them as well. Of those 400 calls and emails, I'm conducting around 50 site visits statewide. Um, and again, as you can see, private and pub public infrastructure are over 50% of what those, those um, complaints actually are. And as of 2000, September 2022, we've installed around 330 total installations statewide, um, and that's influenced over 3,600 acres of wetland habitat, which I think is really awesome. And of those 330, we currently have 124 that are currently functioning, continuing to maintain 1,700 acres of wetlands. Um, and you may look at that and be like, if you've installed 330, why are only 124 still working? Um, and really, it's because beaver activity changes over time. Um, so we can install a device in a beaver wetland, like a beaver baffle, and it may work for four or five years or however long the beavers are there. But when those beavers deplete the food source and move on, um, what I like to do, if I'm aware of it, I'll actually salvage that material so I can use it elsewhere. Um, so a lot of this is just beavers, um, beaver acti activity changing over time. So now we'll get into 
um, some of the devices that we have to resolve some of these conflicts. So the first one um, that we'll talk about are exclusion fences. Um, an exclusion fence is a device that we can build at the inlet of a culvert um, that helps prevent or tries to prevent beavers from getting access to the culvert. Um, we use what we call goat or feedlot um, feedlot panels that we can buy right at Tractor Supply. The, the important part of this is that the openings are four inch square mesh. Um, we found that if the openings are much bigger, beaver, small beavers can actually get through them. Um, but that four inch is still big enough to allow some of your fish, your reptiles and amphibians to get through. Um, and these devices work best when the beaver primary beaver activity is up away from the culvert. Um, so like that first photo on the left is like an ideal example where the primary beaver activity is up away from the culvert. Beavers were just coming down to the culvert to to plug it, to raise the water level up a little bit. They were hearing that sound of running water. So that's one of the triggers for beavers to build dams is the sound of running water. And culverts are just, they echo that sound. Um, and it's it just calls for beavers to come and plug them. Um, but in sites like this where the primary beaver activity is upstream, these fences can work really well. Um, the, the site often dictates the size and the shape of the fence. Um, so you got you have to work with the landscape a little bit. Um, but again, there's there's factors in whether or not how how effective these fences can uh, work. Um, in our experience, our devices don't work in every situation. Water volume, water depth, the substrate, again, site layout and beaver activity are all factors that determine success. Like this site here, um, we spent, I spent the good part of a day with VTrans installing this device at a fairly large culvert, which the culvert is honestly a little bigger than I typically tackle, just because larger culverts usually indicate um, more water volume flowing through. And what the beavers did here, they were so abundant in this, this location and so active that what they had done was they went just downstream from the culvert and built a dam in essentially a drainage ditch that paralleled the road, backed it up through the culvert over the fence. Um, so again, that's one of the challenges is that the beaver activity in these sites changes. Um, and it depends on how many resources you want to put into sites um, to continue to put into these sites to, to resolve them. So beaver baffles are the other device that we have to use, and these are devices that we install through beaver dams. And the idea is that you're allowing water to escape the, the pond or the impoundment without the beavers figuring out how to stop that flow of water. So you can control that water level to the height that you need, so you're reducing flooding of property or flooding of roads. We have two primary designs that we use. Um, the rectangle baffle on the left um, is a really rugged design that works really well. It's it needs a little more maintenance because the pipe is fairly close to the bottom. So as over time, that baffle will sink down into the mud. So it needs to be lifted up off the bottom. But these can work in your little, your smaller ponds where it's a little tighter space and not as much of an open area. Um, the round baffles, I honestly haven't been using those as much. I've kind of converted to like a, a square baffle design. Um, the round baffles, just the way they are built, you're bending all that wire into a, a cylinder. And I found in the right or the wrong water chemistry, how you're looking at it, um, those welds can actually break and then it just the baffle disintegrates over time. So I've actually gotten away from using round baffles um, and converted to like a square baffle. But these these de devices are going to work better when you have deeper water, bigger area. But it is a de bigger device and it's really important that these remain completely underwater because if they're too close to the surface of the water or sticking above, beavers will actually they'll either hear the water entering the pipe or just feel the current going in and they can they can plug them. So part of the installation process is um, you want to find like the deepest part of the pond, um, dig a notch in the dam and the notch will, the depth of the notch will dictate how much the water level drops. Um, and you really want that cage 
pretty far away from the dam. Um, if it's too close to the dam, the beavers will figure it out and actually end up just burying it. So I say a minimum of 30 feet. And even then, depending on the site, that may be too close. 40, 50, 60 feet away from the dam when possible is ideal. Um, so I didn't show an, a picture of the baffle actually installed because you don't really see much. It's all underwater. Um, but the photo on the right is just before we're ready to put that pipe through that notch. And then that cage gets dropped off um, like on the photo of on the left over the boat and it gets sunk to the bottom and water will fill the pipe. You have to help push it down. Um, water will begin to flow through that pipe and flow on the back side of the dam. And again, the idea is that water's leaving the impoundment without the beavers figuring out how to stop that flow of water or even knowing that water is leaving their impoundment. And again, what this does is reduces the water level in that pond to, to reduce flooding. Similarly to the exclusion fences, um, there are limitations to it. Um, water volume is a big one. You can only move so much water with like a 12 inch pipe. Um, there are going to be sites where you'll get heavy rains. The water level is going to rise. Um, and, and that needs to be that should be expected. And there needs to be some allowance um, for that to happen. Um, when you add water to a system, it's going to uh, rise no matter no matter what you do, no matter how big the pipe is. Um, but again, some of the limitations are water volume, water depth, site layout, and then again, of course, beaver activity. So after you install the device that night, the beavers will typically, should if they're still active there, come back and repair the dam. Uh, so those sticks that are crisscrossed atop are just helping hold the pipe down. You can kind of see the pipe between the two beavers there. And what they've done, they've already repaired the hole at the surface of the water in front of the dam, but they're actually hearing water run through the pipe and they're actually trying to, to stop that. So they're bringing sticks on the backside of the dam to try to stop that sound of water, um, which is just a, a pretty funny video that they got. And it really just drives home the point that the sound of running water is a trigger for beavers to, to build dams. So finally, I always end on this slide. Maintenance is the most important thing that we need to do with these devices. Um, you can't just install one of these devices and, and forget about it, because if you do, it will end up looking like this. Those cages over time will sink into the mud. Um, so what I recommend is once a year, a couple times a year, lift that cage up off the bottom, clean it out, and then set it back down. Because um, again, without maintenance, they're they're not going to last all that long. Um, and we have a database that we tr keep track of our installations. Um, and I try my best to get to all of them to to do the necessary maintenance. But I what I do is I ask landowners to just keep an eye on things and take some responsibility and give me a call if they notice something changing, whether that's the the water rising and not going down in a certain amount of time. Just give me a call and I'll get out there and and look at the site and do whatever changes or, or maintenance that's necessary. Um, but with, with some maintenance, these devices in the right locations can last a really long time. Um, we've had a number of devices that we installed in the early 2000s that I actually just rebuilt fences that I just rebuilt because the wood rotted, but they were continuing to function. Um, and I have no doubt about that they'll continue to function for another 20 years. Um, so again, in the right locations, these devices can work really well. Uh, Tyler, I do have a couple questions for you. Um, Dan uh, writes, uh, can Fish and Wildlife increase the budget to allow the installation of more water flow devices to stop killing beavers? The budget is woefully insufficient. Yeah, um, so our budget actually isn't a limiting factor to how many devices we install. Um, I've never had to turn anyone down because I've ran out of money. Um, again, I'm only the idea of our program is to to influence or maintain beaver created wetland habitat. It, we're, this program is designed for habitat. It's not necessarily designed for for protecting beavers. Again, that's kind of one of the, the outcomes of it. 
but I'm only choosing high quality sites for for our installations. Um, so if somebody has a beaver that's creating issues in their backyard pond, I'm not going to install a device there because it's not protecting any beaver created wetland habitat. The same goes for beavers damming um, like a drainage ditch. In those situations, if landowners want to have alternative resources, there are other people in the region, um, including Skip Lyle, who we'll mention a, in a bit, M Mike Callahan down in Massachusetts that are available, they're private contractors that are available to do um, very similar work that I do as well. Uh, thanks, Tyler. And I got one more that's maybe a little site specific. Uh, Tracy writes, thanks for the presentation. We have a thriving beaver pond and associated wetlands on our property. We also have a farm pond built for watering cattle, which we now use for swimming. Each year when the adolescents are kicked out of, um, by their parents, we have a battle with the youngsters moving into the farm pond. It isn't a pond that would take a baffle. We've tried using human and dog urine to discourage them. Do you have other suggestions for ways to help them move along higher up the watershed? Yeah, I get those calls quite a bit, quite a bit. And it seems like those juvenile beavers will find these farm ponds um, and they don't when they they're kicked out, they don't necessarily know the best habitat or what they're looking for. Um, so sometimes they'll just move into these ponds. They may live there for a little bit, but it really depends on on the food availability there. If there's a bunch of trees there, they may end up um, living there for for a number of years. Um, but if it's kind of like your your open pond with not a lot of trees, they're probably not going to stay there all that long. Great, thank you. And that's all we've got for questions at this time. Oh, Bob, we'll handle uh, we'll handle questions by voice uh, at the end. We're not doing that now. Sorry. Yeah, well, I think I'll jump in with the next section here on uh, beaver management and town planning. Thank you, Tyler, for that great overview of the history of beavers in Vermont and the devices and strategies that we're using today to mitigate some of the potential damages and maximize those, those beaver benefits and provide healthy ecosystems. Um, I'm gonna pivot now and talk a little bit about what some Vermont towns are doing to integrate beaver management into the planning process. So currently there are only just about two towns that have wildlife policies that directly address beaver management on town owned property. And other towns have taken actions to raise awareness and monitor beaver activity town-wide, uh, as um, we all know. And I'll go into some of those examples in a moment. And I'll just note that not all these plans and town stra strategies directly align with the department's view on beaver management, but they're great examples of what the towns can do to control and create guidance and policy on that local level. And land use planning Vermont is done town by town. There's no county government here. So what works in one town may or may not work in another. And these are just a couple of examples that we have to share. So first up, we have Williston's Animal Trapping on Town Land Policy. And they've got uh, Section B covers uh, beaver management uh, specifically. And um, we'll just go over a few of those main points here. So they talk about using preventative measures, first and foremost, um, to uh, use caging, fencing, and baffles, things that Tyler went over. They also call out the Fish and Wildlife Best Management Practice um, and want their town policy to align with those BMPs. We've got a, a link at the, in the chat for that as well, as well as the entire Williston policy, if you want to look at that in, it, in its completion. And they're developing a regular monitoring program to track these changes over time. And Tyler was stressing the importance of that because the activity changes, the landscape changes, uh, the climate changes. So we want to see what's happening and, and make a record of that to really do the best management. And they also, they, they mentioned that beaver problems should be brought to the attention of Fish and Wildlife, um, someone like Tyler, so that we can also help with that tracking and management. And they, they put it in the hands of Public Works in Williston to determine whether trapping is essential to protect town maintained infrastructure. Okay, so now let's move to Shelburne. 
So Shelburne had some beaver conflicts that prop prompted this animal coexistence policy. Um, and I have a draft here. Yeah, this sharing that again in the chat. And I'll just go over some of the uh, a few of their eight principles that I just want to highlight. Uh, they talk about in the policy, all species, human and animal having uh, intrinsic value and being able to coexist in Shelburne. Um, they they say that their policies and practices shall be defined by the best available scientific and community knowledge. And, you know, uh, lastly, their point is that regulations and practices that do get implement, implemented should be developed, developed through this collaborative process with residents, town employees, and other stakeholders. So they really create this roadmap for future decision-making and planning around beaver and other wildlife in the town of Shelburne. And they go one more step and um, talk about zoning in this policy. And they they say that, you know, moving forward, zoning regulations should embrace this coexistence policy. And um, I'll remind you that that Tyler mentioned, uh, you know, a lot of the roads in Vermont were created in this absence when we didn't have beaver in, in the state of Vermont. So now we do have a lot of beaver and their populations are growing. Our populations are growing. Uh, the infrastructure that was laid out is uh, is is sometimes going to come into conflict in that, and we have to create uh, these these planning mechanisms that allow us to adapt and think about uh, how we can coexist better and uh, you know make life happy for us and Beaver. Okay, so Greensboro um, took more of an outreach and education approach uh, in 2022 the greensboro conservation commission brought in wildlife specialists john aberth and skip lyle and uh, they did sort of a community engagement event here and they posted this flyer around town and uh, when the greensboro conservation commission shared this with me there kind of uh, their note was that you know they found that a lot of these conflicts are are really opportunities to to improve beaver habitat um, and if your town is having problems with beavers, maybe you can think about ways or opportunities to bring the community in, educate them on, you know, the habitat that's in their town, why the beaver's there in the first place, and, and start brainstorming solutions for, for solving the problem. Okay, last town example here is going to be from Georgia. Uh, they had a beaver dam that was raising concerns in the Silver Lake Woods area, popular recreation spot. And the Conservation Commission called Tyler up and asked him to do a site visit and provide a, a written report. And in this situation, it, it was really just continual monitoring that Tyler recommended um, back in 2022. And, you know, this just sort of this example highlights that every, every town situation is different depending on the the, you know, the beaver population, the dam size, the age of the dam, location, different management strategies, strategies are going to be needed. And having a survey done by a professional with written recommendations is really valuable for tracking those changes over time. And especially important to keep these documents readily available as, as planners and, and select board members and, and people who, who do land use planning in towns, they change. So we want to have this uh, kind of continuous record so we can all be using that the best available knowledge when we make decisions. So sometimes you just need a stick in the side of the dam to kind of track those changes. That's a great solution. Okay, so we're wrapping up here and I just want to lay out some additional resources for you all. Um, of course, we have the uh, our best management practices and um, you know that li link was shared with you today. So please use that. Um, it's a great step-by-step -step guide on common beaver conflicts. And it's got a number of resources and numbers of who in the department you can call for help. And I'll just I'll just note here, Tyler is is one person and uh, can't be everywhere at once. So that's why we have included a couple other names here: Skip Lyle and Mike Callahan, who are also reputable reputable wildlife biologists and can help you if the department is not available. Wildlifehelp.org is also a spot where you can find a licensed wildlife control professional. Um, so th the the resources are out there. Uh, if, if you see something, you know, call call someone and, and get ahead of it before it becomes a bigger issue. And uh, in conclusion here, I just want to remind everybody there's there's many ways to support conservation in Vermont. 
Uh, you can buy a habitat stamp sticker and that goes to protecting directly to protecting habitat or a non-game wildlife fund donation at tax time. Um, but all of that helps to protecting the places and wildlife that we love. And I want to say thanks so much for, for coming and joining us today. Um, it's a great presentation, Tyler and myself. Um, our numbers and emails are here. So uh, this wraps up the second session of this presentation. And if there's any uh, questions in the chat for me directly, Enz, I can take those or we've got a few moments here. Um, Lincoln, there's nothing in the chat at this time. Um, folks, still feel free to put your questions in the chat. Uh, we we will take a couple other uh, uh, other questions. Um, oh, I'm sorry, just a couple things popped up that I'll handle first. Uh, Zapata writes, there are state rules around the removal of beaver dams, so ask questions first. Uh, thanks for that, Zapata. Uh, and Patty Smith, uh, just giving a shout out, Skip Lyle is amazing. He will install working devices in places that others say can't be beaver proof. So uh, a, a shout out there. Um, thanks for those comments. Uh, Sandy, uh, go ahead and unmute your mic. Thank you very much. Great presentation. Um, I have a question. I've observed um, there are beaver, um, I'm actually in the neighboring state of New Hampshire. Um, there are beaver on a um, in a 47 acre pond that's connected to other water bodies. And I know that the stream has a variety of dams. Um, I've noticed them, um, they'll uh, cut vegetation, you know, high bush blueberry uh, and other things along the shoreline and then sort of leave the uh, cut branches in the water and also uh, unfortunately the pond has a section of Phragmites and so they leave these pieces of Phragmites there which of course can grow and I was kind of curious about are these things that they would normally come back for do they decide that they're uh, uh, that I cut the wrong thing I, I'm, I'm just really curious because um, someone had thought that it was somebody a person cutting uh, shrubs down and then we sort of figured out the stuff was always in the water so thank you yeah that is something they may come back for and get um again beavers really like like hardwood so like your willows um alders aspens uh poplars uh maples they'll typically leave your softwoods like your conifers um so kind of like this picture here you see a lot of um softwood regeneration kind of in the back. There's still a ton of food um, along the water's edge, like those willows. Um, they'll typically leave your spruce, white pine, um, balsam fir alone. Although I have seen them take a few spruce trees um, and they may use them in the dam for building dams. Um, but yeah, what they'll typically do, they go after the smaller stemmed items first because they're a lot easier to deal with but they may chew down a bigger tree and then kind of limit up. They'll take those smaller branches off and then they may leave the stump just because it's too big to, to handle. As far as like high bush blueberries, um, I haven't seen many beavers chew those down. So it may just be what's available for them to eat. Um, but yeah, they'll, they'll chew down a tree and then they'll, over the, the course of the coming days, they'll, they'll limit up and, and eat the bark off of it. Uh, thanks, Tyler. I'll just uh, address a couple in the chat really quick. Um, Christy was writing, uh, is there a best practice for a tree by tree case in protecting them from becoming beaver food? Uh, Dan responded that uh, wrap the tree base with wire mesh or a sandy gritty paint mixture. Any thoughts on that one, Tyler? Yep, no, that's a good recommendation. Um, if you do the fencing, I would recommend getting some fairly rigid fencing. You don't really want to use chicken wire because beavers can cook collapse it and I wouldn't recommend wrapping it directly around the tree because as the tree grows um, it can act actually girdle itself growing into that that wire so I would actually build like a fence out away from from the tree trunk itself um, and then as mentioned the abrasive paint mixture is another really good option um, we have the recipe on on our BMPs and it's online too um, but it's um, Exterior latex paint, you get the color to try to max, match the tree bark so it blends in and then you mix it with a certain amount of masonry sand and you paint the bottom or three, four feet of the tree. Um, 
and that that mixture is really abrasive on the beaver's teeth. So they may take a couple of bites and realize it doesn't taste that good. It wears on their teeth really quickly and then they'll move on. Um, it does need to be reapplied every couple of years as the tree grows. I do think it works better on um, trees that are maybe uh, like calf or like thigh width or in diameter rather than your smaller trees just because those smaller trees grow so quickly and it's really easy for a beaver to chew those down in just a few few bites. Great, thanks Tyler. Um, Bob, uh, go ahead and unmute your mic. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you for the presentation. Uh, a couple of questions, well, comment and a question. First of all, in the Champlain Valley where we have a lot of non-native invasive plants, we have We've been monitoring a beaver site and and one of the challenges is they certainly take the native plants and for the most part leave the non natives. They will have seen them use honeysuckle in their dams and they will take down ammer maple. I'm guessing they use that. You know, hopefully they eat that. Uh, they will not touch buckthorn. So that's just one of the dynamics that we see and we're trying to figure out how to manage that. And then uh, the other thing, um, oh, sorry about the dog. So when you put in your flow, your flow control device, the upstream, you know, the section in the beaver pond, you set the level and it didn't really show or do you just drop it down and just let water flow? Um, so I think I understand your question. Um, the, the notch that we carve in the beaver dam will ultimately set the height of the new water level. Um, so that pipe, you'll have your cage, that cage gets dropped underwater and that cage will be set on the bottom of the pond. Um, water enters the pipe, flows along through the pipe, which all run along the bottom and then up and through the dam and then down the backside. Um, and it's okay, the, so the it's height the, of the Yeah, it's the height of the pipe through the beaver dam that will ultimately set the water level. Thank you, that makes sense. Thank you. Yeah. All right, um, uh, a shout out from Penny, wonderful presentation, thank you. Uh, Jennifer suggests that Protect Our Wildlife also has funds to help mitigate beaver problems. Uh, I think that's all we've got. I'll do one last, uh, um, one last uh, ask if anyone has any Additional questions, you can put them in the chat or raise your hand uh, to unmute your mic. Bob, is that another one? Go ahead. Sure, I always have questions. Okay, so you guys are, I'm sure some of you are aware of the, uh, of the uh, incident in Heinsberg where somebody was taking down a bunch of beaver dams on, um, actually it was, on town lands and in his interview uh, in the paper he stated um, uh, he's been visited many times by state uh, wildlife department representatives and has talked about his handling of beaver dams and has never been challenged you know, but they've never challenged him on his methods. And, and so I guess, and not that I necessarily take that if, uh, if, if face value, but I guess my question is, is, uh, is the policies that you're, uh, that you're conveying here, is that pretty well accepted throughout DEC and Fish and Wildlife? Is everyone advocating uh, the same policies? Yeah, I won't get too into the weeds of that specific situation, um, but I've never visited that property or spoke with that gentleman, so I don't know who he spoke with. Um, but we work pretty closely with DEC because a lot of these rules or a lot of the rules out there are Department of Environmental Conservation rules, specifically what you can and cannot do around wetlands, um, what you can and cannot do within streams. Um, so I work very closely with our river management engineers and our wetland staff, the DEC, when, when some of these conflict sites come up, because it is important that we're all on the same page and we're making sure that we have the interest in the environment, water quality, all that stuff in mind. Um, 
but it also is a challenge too because we need to make sure that we're protecting our public and private infrastructure um, because we all rely on being able to get from point A to point B um, in a safe manner. Thanks, Tyler. And speaking of DEC, Zapata, go ahead and unmute your mic. Hi, Jens. Yeah, I have a I have a question. So I'm a district wetland ecologist, and I get a lot of phone calls around uh, beaver dams and and beavers and and conflict, um, and how to resolve those. And sometimes it's about removing uh, beaver dams, um, especially if a, a baffle or other solution uh, might not be appropriate for a site. One of the big things I get from private landowners is this question around liability, that if they have a, a beaver pond, beaver dam on their property, such that the storage of water behind that dam is, is significant, that if the dam is breached through a flood event or, or negligence um, or activity on that dam by, by an individual, releasing water downstream that causes damage. Um, I know that we've we've kind of been looking into it, but it's it's a broader question um, as beavers continue to move across the landscape and especially higher up in our watersheds. Um, didn't know if there had been any conversations happening in, in fish and wildlife around that topic. Yeah, it's not really a, a question I can answer. Um, it would be a question for, for an attorney to, to answer um, about liability. All right. Um, there's uh, uh, Dan just uh, wanted to uh, mention that uh, game wardens need to be brought on board and, and uh, regarding the topic of making sure we're all on the same page. Um, and with that, I think uh, that's everything. Um, so folks, uh, thank you all so much for joining us. Uh, Tyler, thank you for your expertise. Lincoln, thank you so much. That was uh, really great. And uh, have a good afternoon, everybody. Take Thanks, care. everybody.